My name is Provost Ben Vinson, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. I've heard from our alumni staff that we've had up to 600 viewers at these Spartan setups, uh, which is absolutely amazing. And I'm hopeful that today's turnout will be similarly strong. Uh, before I introduce you to our panelists, I just wanted to say a few words about today's topic, teaching and learning in a remote world. Now, right now, there's a swirl of conversation about the future of the residential college and higher education and about the impact of remote and online learning on our enterprise. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen the headlines like this one from the New York Times, remember the MOOCs? After near death, they're booming. Or this other one, also from the Times, the future of college is online and it's cheaper. Or even this one from Wired, when schools reopen, don't ditch online learning. So some might say that we've encountered a pivot point in the history of higher education, one that is an indicator of our true future. But as we thrust more, uh, even more fully, into online forms of educational delivery and into a new way of thinking and doing our work as a university, we are also left with many questions. The first thing that comes to mind is, is it the same? Can the experiences of a residential university translate into a more digital social world? How do we continue to robustly cultivate learning and the life of the mind online, using different synapses, different ways into how we think, how we react, how we inform ourselves? How do faculty who have long been accustomed to in-person delivery alter their techniques and approaches to connect with their students through screens, or through holograms or through phones. How sophisticated does an online platform need to be in order to be successful? And what about the technologies of our students, the ones that they use to learn and engage with their classmates and their professors? This technology filter, which may be an appendage of us, do the richer students have an unfair advantage that may unfairly tilt and skew the social mobility ladder in ways that exclude many of us. Now, as technology itself matures, and as it quickly matures, will this finally accelerate changes of pedagogy that have, for at least to this point in history, been glacially slow to evolve in universities throughout the world? Since the Socratic method, and since the deep and debate-filled arguments that filled the University of Padua in the 13th century, and since seminar and lecture formats became standard modes of delivery, will new technology ultimately disrupt what we've known as higher education over the last several centuries? So these and more are just some of the questions on our mind today. As higher education moves through a significant moment of transition, we know that these questions are on the minds of our students, on the minds of our parents and society as a whole. Now, as Case Western Reserve looks from its particular window, window at the challenges ahead and at a fall semester in which we will be delivering classes using a dual delivery method, we know there will be more challenges, more questions to come, and we also feel a sense of gravity. We know that the decisions that we make now may have lasting consequences that we've yet to imagine. Now, I can assure you that as and when the inevitable happens, that is, when an instant occurs that we did not see coming, we know that we will be ready to flex, to adjust, to shift, to quickly transition when called upon to do so. This is what we do. This is who we are. It is part of our Spartan creed to move forward into the unknown as a community with the mission of further fostering the excellence of our community in mind. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce today's panelists to you. Up first is Dr. Susan Burden Gully. Susan is a senior instructor who joined the Department of Biology in 2013. Since that time, she has accumulated a breadth of teaching expertise and experience in courses geared toward students at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Her teaching style emphasizes critical thinking and data analysis and she utilizes application-based instruction to support a deeper understanding of course material. Absolutely beloved by her students, 
She is a 2018 recipient of the Student Choice Awards for Outstanding Faculty in the Department of Biology. This is a revered award. In addition, she has been nominated multiple times for the Carl F. Whitkey Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Education. As chair of the Biology Undergraduate Curriculum Committee, she worked closely with biology faculty and the college administration to develop the course requirements for the new neuroscience major, which is assured to be one of our hottest majors. Currently, she serves on the Committee for Educational Programs in the College of Arts and Sciences. Welcome, Susan. Thank you for inviting me. Next up is Karen Braun. Dr. Braun is a professor of accountancy and is the lead author of an accounting textbook that is used at over 200 colleges and universities in both the United States and Canada. She is also a five-time winner of the Weatherhead Undergraduate Teaching Award. Let me just say that one more time. She is a five-time <laughs> winner of the Weatherhead Undergraduate Teaching Award, which is voted upon by students. And in 2018, she was named one of the top 50 business professors in the United States by Poets and Quants. Karen's teaching interests center on managerial accounting, which stems from her prior work experiences as an auditor and a corporate controller. And her primary research interests focus on accounting education, lean operations, which is very important at this time, uh, mind you, and sustainability. Karen's teaching philosophy encourages students to think like business people first and then focus on how managerial accounting can be used to help solve business problems. Now, Karen is passionate about personal finance. I don't know if you sleep and, and, and breathe and do everything about it, but she is deeply passionate about this. She teaches a course on the subject, and during the past year, she has also led 16 different workshops on personal finance for faculty and staff as part of Case Western Reserve University's wellness program. Welcome, Karen. Thank you very much for having me. I want to thank both of you for being here. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about our conversation today. Uh, it is absolutely one of the hot topics a buzz on campus right now. I know faculty all over the place are talking about dual delivery. Uh, we, I think I was just talking to my chief of staff this morning. This is one of the most generative moments, I think, in the conversations of pedagogy uh, in higher education right now. I've not seen anything like it in my career. Um, so I, I am absolutely delighted once again to have you here. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Braun, I'm going to start with you. Uh, now, what were your thoughts when you learned that classes were going remote? I want you to take well, us, uh, I want you to take us, if you don't mind, take us through uh, uh, from the first time you learned about this uh, uh, to your first day teaching Zoom. All right. So I knew you were going to ask me that question. And so I prepared a couple of slides to, to help us get there. Um, the, the first one was that, uh, let's see if I can get it to go. Here we go. I was actually on my second honeymoon when this all started over spring break. Uh, so I was looking at this picture that you see right in front of us. And I got the email that we were going online and that students would be leaving campus and not returning until after April 6. So the first thing that popped in my mind was I was very concerned about my students and their mental health. Um, you know, most of our students are very traditional, so they're 18 to 22 years old. And my first thought is this is the first crisis that they've been through that they probably will actually remember. Um, they were babies during 9-11. They probably didn't remember what happened with the financial crisis. So I was really concerned about that aspect. So the first thing I did, I let the, the news settle for a day. And then I started sending emails. I sent several during that week that I was on Grand Cayman, just kind of calming them, reassuring them, it's going to be OK. We're going to come out of this better, stronger. You'll be able to take these experiences forward with you and know that you can cope up with whatever life throws you in the future. And then I also assured them, hey, I know we were gonna have an upcoming test the second day back after spring break, forget it, that's not gonna happen. We'll either postpone it definite, indefinitely or you know, add it on at the very end. Um, the next thing that crossed my mind was, I'm in charge of our spring awards banquet and we were expecting 120 guests, including students who were receiving awards, um, recruiters that come in, and we were having a mentoring of Event, uh, with that, that uh, we had a number of young alumni coming in for. 
So I had to get in touch with our university center to see if could we reschedule it for after April 1st and all of that. And then after those two things happened, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to teach online. I've never taught online before, but I have given webinars, but I've never been in charge of the technology angle of it, which always scares me a little bit. Um, so as you can see, the technology scares me a little bit because I can't even get it going here. So um, when I landed back in the United States, that's when the world when really began. Uh, I knew I had three days to get up and running on this. So I started doing all the training I could. Uh, Zoom had vendor training online. Case Western had training. We have Suzanne Healy is our director of online learning at Weatherhead. She was fabulous, helped me out, did extra even sessions on the side. And then I got a hold of my TAs as well. And I said, hey, what's going on from the student perspective? You know, what, what's the feeling out there? And they basically said, you know what, we're inundated by emails how do we find the link where we're gonna have these Zoom meetings? I'm like, oh, that's your number one concern. I can handle that. So, you know, I set that up on our Canvas course. And then I practice with my daughters. I've got one in Arizona and one in London who is sequestered there. And so I'm like, perfect opportunity to practice internationally. So I did polls with them. I did breakout rooms with them, made sure all the technology worked. And then finally, I got a hold of my students and said, be patient with me. You know, this is my first time to, We'll make sure it works, but you know, it might take me a little while until I get that technology going. Then I started thinking about, oh my goodness, I've got 15% of my students are international. So I sent out an email to all of them and said, hey, are you safe, number one? Are you okay? And then where are you? And I have students, I wrote them down here, India, South Africa, Switzerland, China, Vietnam, Guam. And I spoke with a number of them, just one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings. How are you doing? What, where are you at? And some of them were in military camps in Vietnam with like seven other people in the room. They were quarantined there for 14 days. So you hear these stories and you're like, I really have to be careful. These people are really under a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. And the last thing I want to do as a professor is put any more stress on them. So that really informed me as to how I should go forward with the class. Then I had the time zone differences to deal with. And so I started thinking about, okay, what are we gonna do if you know people can't join at the regular time? So there, luckily we could do the recordings that I could send them and I said, don't worry about quizzes, don't worry about assessment. Well, we'll get that all worried out. I just don't want you to stress out. So the first day of class came three days later and I tried the polls, just taking their polls, seeing how they were offering, hey, if you're totally stressed, give me a call, let's talk, you're not alone. And, and I put them in breakout rooms as well because that way they could see their classmates that they were familiar with and could just feel like, okay, I'm not alone. I'm going through this with other people who are in the same, uh, same boat as I am. We were also going to do a project that day that was very content based. And I thought this might be too stressful for some of them. So I gave them a choice of a couple different projects, one easier than the other, put them in those groups so they had someone to work with. And I said, I'm not gonna grade it. Just do the best you can. It's all about effort. It's all about learning at this point. And you know what, even though I said they weren't, I wasn't gonna grade it, they worked really hard. Our students have been amazing through this whole experience. And then I also had my TAs there in case I messed up the technology, which I was pretty sure I would do, and I did. <laughs> so I had them co-hosting the meeting so that I could jump right back in. And then at the end of the day, everybody's like, you know what? That worked pretty well. And my TAs actually said, you know, it was fun visiting the breakout rooms, talking with the students, seeing how they were doing, not only on the project, but just in general as human beings. How are you doing? How are you coping and, and holding up? So I, I do have to say that some classes probably wouldn't translate as well as mine did into Zoom. Um, I have my students buy a lecture packet at the beginning of the year. I'm gonna hold it up here just briefly, $6. And it covers 
everything that we're going to do throughout the course of the semester. And it's over here on the right hand side of the screen, just one page of it, but it's all the activities, all the questions. And normally I say, hey, take a couple minutes, answer what you can, and then we'll regroup and we'll go over the answers. So then I have my slides, which you can see at the bottom of the screen that really mimic or mirror what they have in their packets. And I can write on those with my Surface Pro. So usually I project that over on the overhead um, in the classroom, but I could just project it on Zoom. So that worked out really well. The other thing I do a lot of in my class are Excel-based projects that I've made up. And so those already were digital format, except for one of them, which I then had to translate or convert into digital. And my TAs were pretty cute. They were like, you know what? We like the digital format better because back when we had your class a couple of years ago, it was still paper based. This is way better. So, so anyway, it ended up working out really well. Um, so after that, um, oh, let me also say that the textbook that the students buy is an e-text. So they already had that handy and they do the online homework as well. So that was no issue. Um, so at the end of the first full week, I really wanted to check the pulse again and really talk about let's change our grade weighting from what I had originally planned at the beginning of the semester. So I said, you know what, let's get rid of the assessments like quizzes, the final at the end, I'll make open note. We're going to put less weight on that. More, more weight is going to be based on effort. And you know, students were amazing, as I said. There, that effort was 100% there. They, they, they blew me away at how well they adapted to this situation. So I would say the, the only headache I really had was what to do about the final exam. Um, I like to give them a piece of paper and a problem and say, go at it, show me what you know. And that's not so easy to do online. I imagine you can do it, but under the time crunch, it was pretty tough. So I had to go to an online kind of multiple choice type format, which is not my favorite. And then you have to worry a little bit about academic integrity as well. So I said, you know what, let's let level the playing field. Let's make this open note so that you don't have to worry about other people, you know, um, having access to notes and some people not. So I did do that, but I made a time constraint on it um, so that they wouldn't really have too much time to consult their notes. And they knew that going in. And I gave them a 24 hour window because again, I have people in China that are 12 hours different. And then I also divided the final into two distinct parts where I said, okay, take, I don't care what order you take them in. Part of it's going to cover what we would have covered in the midterm. Part of it's going to cover what we would have had in the final. You, you take them in whatever order you want. And as long as you do them both in that same 24 hour window, uh, that's all I care about. I have to say though, I was shaking in my shoes through the whole exam process. This made me so nervous because um, I'm like, how are they going to adapt to this? How are their scores going to correlate with earlier um, exams that I had given? And so at the end, I did compare their scores uh, on their final exams with the earlier scores. And really, they were within about 10 points. So I felt like most people handled it pretty well. And I didn't really have to make any sort of great adjustment from there. So that's kind of just a little bit about uh, you know my journey from start to that first day through. Dr. Brown, what, what an incredible experience beginning on your honeymoon. I mean, yeah. that, that's just, I mean, that, that, what, that is amazing. Uh, and I think it also underscores the flexibility and, and your ability to also imagine and iterate as you were actually teaching. What, what an incredible, uh, incredible story. Um, I'd like to turn now uh, to Dr. Burden Gully. Um, the next question is for you. Now, how does one teach biology remotely? Um, I, I, was talking, um, I was talking with your chair, I mean, and, and he uh, uh, mentioned there's really a number of special challenges, um, provisions that need to be made, uh, um, labs. How do you structure those? Um, Dr. Burden Gully, can you enlighten us? Um, you are absolutely correct. Teaching biology is filled with challenges because so many of our courses are directed to be hands-on experiential learning. So we have a lot of you know, standard lecture courses, large enrollment, small enrollment courses, but the lab courses, they can be computer labs, they could be field courses where the students typically go out into the field, collect specimens, and then you know, identify them and analyze them, and wet labs that are held in the actual classroom. Um, so quite a few unique challenges. And when considering how to translate that to a remote format, 
I, I was pondering this and I really actually leaned on what was covered in the Learning Fellows Program. So I participated in that in the fall semester of 2018. That's a program that's offered by the University Center for Innovation in Teaching and Education. And basically the, what I gleaned from that program was to really focus on the course objectives and then use backwards design you know, strategies to develop my class. So I looked at my learning goals thought about the skills that I really wanted the students to come away with after taking this lab. So being able to use a scientific method to design and conduct their experiments, um, to be able to analyze data, to basically refine their scientific writing and presentation skills, that's really key. And then apply their knowledge, be able to apply the knowledge that they've learned in books and in the background information through this hands-on learning. And I wanted to connect that material to their long-term career objectives. That was really key as well. So like Karen just mentioned, I also lean very heavily on uh, the TLT group at UTech. So this is a group that provided a vast amount of information for you know, how to use technology, the Zoom technology, the Echo 360. They had webinars and drop-in hours. And I took advantage of all of that over spring break because you know, we were all a little bit panicked. Like, I don't even know how to use this software. <laughs> But they were fantastic and that was amazing. And two things that I, I gleaned from that as well, from all their webinars was the, the sense of community is so key for online learning and communication with the students. So making them feel like they have a vested interest in this course and communicating them, even over communicating with them so they know what to expect. They're on, you know, on point with deadlines and everything and they really feel a vested interest in the course. So the, the lab that I, core, that I teach is the Development and Physiology Lab. And that's the third of this three introductory labs that all biology majors take. And the vast majority of pre-med students and pre-health students take the course as well. So um, for that particular class, what I decided to do was put together, basically assembled a variety of different tools that I used to, for instruction. So some of them were videos for anatomy and physiology as well as cell movement during development. And I also utilized this LT online learning platform, which was provided by the company that um, makes the data acquisition devices that we use in the in-person model. So they provided some online lessons and laboratory experiments with sample data. So what I could do was edit these lessons to more closely tailor them to my learning objectives and then the sample data, the students would you do these simulation labs with the sample data, analyze them, and then they wrote the reports based on the data that they analyzed. So asynchronously, they went through and did this, these lessons, they viewed the videos, they, they did the sample experiments, and then worked together collectively in lab groups to analyze and report out on them. So we came back together synchronously for recitation meetings and during that time period, the students had the opportunity to do the oral presentations and their poster presentations and really feel like they were part of a community. And the other thing that was really important to them were the patient case studies that I incorporated to most of these experiments, because it gave them the opportunity to take the knowledge that they had learned in the lecture course and in the background materials from the laboratory and apply it to a real world case scenario. So that was really critical to them. And um, similar to what Karen was saying, the very first day that we were together in our synchronous meeting, the students were, were set apart into breakout groups in Zoom. And I had designed those groups so that they would be comprised of a mix of students from different majors and different levels of progress toward fulfilling their degree requirements so that we would have people in each group that had a variety of different backgrounds. And so they brought their knowledge and their expertise from their background to the table in their group. And that was really effective because I saw it come to play during their presentations. They really bounced off of one another really well. They brought ideas to the table that everyone else considered. And it was tremendous. And I will say I have to very highly, um, <laughs> well, I can't talk highly enough about our students. They are amazing students. They are resilient, very intelligent, really motivated to learn. And I also found that they were very adaptable to the transition to the online instruction. And they gave us some feedback that we were able to use in real time. You know, we could change on the fly based on their feedback and try to optimize things as we went. And they were very patient with us. And it was, it was actually a much more pleasurable experience than I thought it might be. <laughs> 
Well, Susan and Karen, I, I want to thank you both uh, for, for sharing these experiences with us. I've got to say, too, um, I, I, like you, can't say enough about our students. They are truly remarkable, and they have exhibited incredible, incredible resilience during this time. But let me say something else, too. The same goes for our faculty. Our faculty have been incredible, and it is absolutely clear to me why both of you have received such incredible accolades uh, in the teaching realm, because you've done some things that uh, were truly difficult, and you've done it with a smile. Um, and so I, I, I've got to applaud you. I, I want to give just a couple of reflections before we uh, go to the audience for some questions. Um, the first is, both of you have uh, commented on something that I think is quite interesting for us to consider. As you abruptly shifted from your in-class delivery to, uh, to this remote delivery form, what you did was actually reflected on the essence of our mission. What is it that we do? What are the core objectives? You scrubbed your syllabi, you thought about what, what it is you're trying to accomplish, you went back to the bare bones, and then you figured out uh, how, to, how, to, how to deliver that in this new way. It's a lot like what we're doing as a university. In this moment of COVID, we've been stripping, our, we've been stripping down to our essence. Teaching, learning, research, and community have guided us through this crisis. You're doing the same thing uh, in the classroom. The other thing is that you listened. You listened to our students. You listened to their needs. This is so important as we, as we evolve uh, this pedagogy. And uh, again, I am so excited by, by your uh, ability to do that. Um, and, 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 and finally, um, you, you also imagine something different based on, uh, uh, based on uh, your, your past practices and where the uncertainties of the moment were guiding you. And so I give you all tremendous accolades uh, for, for your efforts. And uh, I know that you are shining examples for our faculty, and we hope to tap you more uh, uh, as, we, as we also prepare our faculty for the fall. I want to go out there now to the audience, because I know you've got a lot of questions for us. And so I'm going to, uh, I've been receiving uh, uh, questions here flashing up on my screen, and I want to go to those uh, as we now move uh, into this uh, question and answer period. Some of it you've started to answer, but let me penetrate a little bit deeper. And this gets at something that uh, I, as a provost, need to know about. How did Case Western Reserve address the issues regarding Wi-Fi and technology and accessibility for our disadvantaged students? Did you have any of these situations in your, in your classrooms? Have you heard rumors? What do we do? What do we do right? What do we need to do as we get ready for the fall? So either of you can take it. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the only problems that some of my students encountered were primarily the students that were overseas, uh, <clears throat> where I don't know if it was a broadband issue or again, when they were in quarantine, maybe in a military camp or something, and they really didn't have access. Um, at that point, again, I just reassured them, don't, don't worry, we will work this out. This is going to be based more on effort. And I think they put in 110% effort in the end because they are so driven to learn. Um, but that was the biggest challenge. So sometimes they couldn't uh, get into the Zoom sessions or what have you. And, you know, I, I would have separate Zoom sessions just with them. We'd pick a time like, you know, 12 hours apart, but seven in the morning, seven at night where we could both meet, <laughs> you know, instead of 12 and 12 or something like that. Um, and then, you know, emails, things like that, where we were, we were able to work it out. We just had to be flexible. I agree. Those were similar challenges that I encountered as well. Um, some students did not have reliable internet. Some of them did not have access to a computer that had recent enough software to see images on exams that were posted through Canvas. And so I think it really came down to patience and flexibility, trying to work with individual students, helping them through their personal situation. I had a student that was in the process of moving, so she was trying to participate in the class as she was moving across country. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty incredible, but I think across the board, everyone that I spoke with, at least in the biology department, they all said, we're trying to be as flexible as we can. We want to support our students first. They are the most important aspect here. Everybody's in the state of transition in the spring term, and we're doing our best to go through this and really keep them engaged in the learning process and just support them the best that we can. Thank you for that. Um, Uh-oh, others are popping up on the screen. I got to get to it. Um, one has to do with grading. 
So both of you have talked about final exams. Both of you have talked about assessment. Uh, this has been uh, produced an avalanche of, uh, of response from our faculty. And I, I've got to say too, we in the provost office were very worried about the assessment of our students. What grading challenges have resulted from this new platform for you? And how do we imagine grading moving forward? Mm. So for me, again, having a high stakes like final exam, I just didn't like the idea of it. Um, one of the things I did, I felt like I had really good rapport with my students going into this crisis. So before the final exam, I just I sent them an email and I said, you know what, the basis of all relationships are is trust. You don't have a relationship without trust. I hope that you found me to be trustworthy throughout this whole experience and throughout the whole semester. And I likewise am going to trust you. Um, here, I'm going to try and level the playing field. Everybody is going to be open note because I know, I mean, my husband and his office, he's got five screens. And some students are going to have five screens, others are going to have one screen. So I wanted to level that playing field as much as I can. Um, and then as far as the exam, that took me forever to create, even though I reduced the weight on it, because you can use pooled questions where not every student's getting the same exact question. You can shuffle up the questions. You can shuffle up the multiple choice answers. You can do a lot of things, but whenever you have a system in place, I don't care where you are and what, you know, what organization, people can game the system, right? And so it really, to me, goes back to, again, trust. I'm going to do whatever I can to, uh, to, to ensure academic integrity. But in the end, it comes back to what kind of people do we have here and what kind of students do we have? And I, I start the semester, honestly, talking about integrity in the business world and how I once quit a job because my boss asked me to cook the books. And I'm like, you have to draw your line in the sand. And so I'm hoping, you know, that that comes back to them, that whether they're in school or they're in industry, at some point, they're going to be asked to cross that line and they need to be able to look themselves in the mirror and say, I'm not gonna cross it. Well, I, I wanna thank you both for that. And I, I, I'm getting, again, just now, the stuff's starting to come in here uh, pr pretty hot and heavy, but let, 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 me, uh, let, let me go to a quick one for you um, very quickly. Uh, it, there's a way in which this remote delivery puts us in direct contact with our lives, right? Uh, you, and everyone on this call must be able to appreciate this to some extent. Um, how did that influence your teaching, uh, your ability to relate, uh, and then your students? You're, you're entering their lives literally, and sometimes in their bedrooms. Did this skew or alter the teaching in any way? And again, this one has to be a quick one because this, this stuff's coming fast and furious. <laughs> Okay, I have to say I craved the connection with the students. You know, going online, that was the thing that I was really concerned about losing because have, interacting with them in person on a daily basis is just a tremendous thing. I get quite a bit of inspiration from them and I think it's an amazing interaction. And so to be able to establish that through Zoom is very important. Establishing that sense of community and maintaining that connection was critical. I know, um, too, sometimes students were advised not to put on their webcams just to save on broadband. But I always said, if you can, put your, put your camera on because we want to see each other. We want that connection that you were just talking about. And it's hard to teach to a name on the screen, but it's easy if you have a face with it and you see the body language. Um. I'm not sure we're going to be able to get through everything here, but let me go. Let me now pick and choose Ed via live stream. Thank you, Ed, for, for sending this out. Um, this may be a fast one. Uh, what is in the lecture packet? Ed wants to know. <laughs> What's in there? What's in it? It's everything we're going to do throughout the semester. So I have all the conceptual questions, all the problems that we want to attempt. And then the Excel-based projects are more or less business simulations. So take that basic knowledge and apply it to a novel situation just as you would in a business. Thanks for that. 
Um, we've got uh, a couple from Tom via live stream. So I'm going to go through, uh, I'm going to go through these from Tom. Um, Tom, you say that the MS in medical physiology program in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics has had an internet remote option for nine years. About 25% of our 175 first year students typically take the program over the internet. Now this year, we're seeing a 60% increase in applications, possibly because uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have this internet option. So his question to us, has the number of undergraduate applications similarly increased this year? Uh, are, have you been able to see anything, any demand in your courses? I will say, Tom, that we have, uh, uh, we've been pretty, uh, pretty consistent in our record-breaking number of applications as a university, around 20, 27, 29,000 applications. Um, but what are you guys seeing out there? What's the demand looking like? It's high, absolutely. So. The summer courses, I've just finished teaching a segment for a summer course uh, offering at the lab, and most of the biology courses are fully enrolled this summer. They've hit their limits and have waiting lists for some. And I was speaking to some of the students that are were taking my lab in the May term. Some of them are taking up to 12 credits this summer. Wow. They are really taking advantage of the situation. They thought, well, I am going to be almost a semester ahead when I come back to the university. They are taking advantage of these classes, and, and by and large, they're really enjoying it. Interesting. I would say in the business school, we haven't usually offered online courses for undergrads. And this summer we were asked that, hey, if anybody would like to offer some, could you do it? So of course, being passionate about personal finance, I decided to offer a course in that. And uh, we started that yesterday and I've got quite a few people signed up for that as well. So I do think the demand for online summer education is definitely there. Let's slip over to Facebook right now. We've got, uh, we've got a question over from, Will, from Lynn Williams. Uh, Lynn, thanks for being uh, on the call today. Um, remote de she asks, remote delivery is often very challenging for students with learning differences such as ADHD who need that in-person connection. So what have you found helpful in these situations? Um, have you either encountered any of this? And how do, how do we make those connections? Thanks, Lynn. I think, you know, a few of my students, um, you know, we've had just one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings, and I feel like I've actually gotten to know a number of them much better. They feel more comfortable just, yeah, they don't like to come to office hours in person usually. I don't know if you feel the same way, Susan, but, <laughs> but this, when I set up online office hours, just sign up on my Google Calendar for a half an hour chat, they were there in force, and a lot of it was about you know, personal things, not just academic. Karen? Great. Um, any, any more comments on that one? Same sort of thing. I mean, so I had a student um, who had some learning uh, disabilities and one-on-one -on -one meetings were the key. I'm trying to keep them engaged and making sure that everything was absolutely clear and they fully understood what was you know needed to be done and felt supported. Well, thank you. That's an excellent question, and and thank you for that, Lynn uh, from Facebook. Let's zip back over now to the live stream where we've got uh, where the activity is pretty hot. Uh, let's go to K K on the live stream. Um, in the context of dual learning, do you have any plan uh, or advice to minimize or eliminate the gap between the experiences of students who are able to attend classes in person next fall? and those who may have to continue learning remotely for a little bit longer. How do you, how do you toggle here? Thanks, Kay. Karen, do you want to address that first? or do you Well, want <laughs> I would say I'm still working on it. <laughs> that is the big challenge. How do you provide an equal experience to both groups? And uh, yeah, that's what I'm just trying to figure out this, this, uh, this summer, because part of the benefit of being in person is being able to work. I always say, work with your neighbor on this, you know? And we won't be able to say that except the neighbor is six feet across. So I don't even know how that aspect is going to work. So I'm really still in the formative stages of trying to figure out how I'm going to make this dual delivery work for both groups, both populations. I think for lab courses, we typically do quite a bit of group work as well. And so when I think about what I was doing with the online format of the lab, 
students still worked in groups. They still analyzed the data together as a group and they reported out on it, worked on patient case studies as a group. But I've been speaking with some of the other faculty members in our department who are planning to teach field courses this fall. And some of the, the ways that they're addressing have been really interesting. You know, normally they would take the students on the bus out to the farm and the students would go and collect the data. They would, you know, collect specimens from the ponds or from the, the woods there and they would catalog them and whatnot. So some of the faculty have actually set up webcams on the trails to try to identify organisms that are in that area right now. And they're setting up data loggers. So they're keeping track of um, sounds, so frog calls. For example, Mike Bernard's doing frog call recordings, and then he's hoping to be able to use them in the classroom and have the students analyze the calls, understand what the organism is that's making that call, and, and be able to do comparisons between areas where the data was collected. Um, the other possibility is, is setting up live tanks in a classroom where you could have specimens in the classroom, and then students can design experiments. And if they can't be there in person, then Maybe the, the professor or their, their TA could run the experiment and record it and then give the data to the student who designed it and then they can analyze that experiment. So they've been really creative with different ways to address some of these, these questions and still try to make it as interactive and hands-on for the student as they can. That's very interesting. Having been out to the farm, taking my kids out there and, and, and looked at that. I mean, what, a, what an inter interesting way to use technology uh, to kind of to, to really plug into nature. And I see you're in nature now, right now. Uh, and, and you're really introducing <laughs> us. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, uh, uh, so thank, uh, thank you, Kay, for that for that great question. Um, let's let's stay on the live stream for a moment. Uh, Joel, Joel uh, via live stream. Uh, he says, when the pandemic ends, what permanent changes in teaching will remain? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I always think one of our number one concerns is always engaging the students, motivating the students, uh, providing the content and the academic rigor that we want to provide. And that will never change. No matter what happens with the technology, we still have to go back to those uh, initial goals of an education and focus on that. Well, I definitely agree. Um, really highlighting those aspects of our course we would like our students to learn, trying to get them prepared for their future careers. Mm -hmm and really teaching them to work in collective groups because I think moving forward, it seems like in general, the work environment is more collaborative. It's not working in a silo. People are coming together as teams and working together, whether it's you know in the business community or in research groups. I mean, they're collaborating between laboratories to, to move forward on projects. So I agree, it's, it's still the teamwork and um, collaborative efforts. You know, I have to say on the teamwork, too, that Zoom has worked very well for me with the breakout rooms because in person, my classes were so packed, it was hard to shuffle the grouping around. And I like to do that during the semester so that they learn to work with new people. But in Zoom, you can set it to just randomly assign people to groups. And so every day they would be working with new team members. And so I'd always say, well, start by introducing yourselves, take five minutes to do that before you actually even get into the content. Because again, the basis of everything is trust in that relationship um, that you're building with your teammates. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to wrap up soon. We're butting up against time. I want to thank uh, Susan and Karen, both of you, for uh, for sharing uh, your incredible incredible insights here. Um, before we break, let me just uh, give. I, I think we can tuck in this very last question. Uh, I'll take one more question, um, and it's this. This is an excellent one. When in person uh, teaching resumes in the fall, when we move to dual delivery, what are you looking the most forward to? That's easy. <laughs> Seeing people in person, in person. As Susan said earlier, I crave that, that student relationship. Um, I'm also uh, the uh, advisor for our Beta Outside group, which is our accounting uh, club, basically, if you will. And just having those one-on-one relate -on -one relationships with our students, that's what it's all about. That's why I'm here. And so it'll be awesome to see that. I actually had two students stop by my house a week ago with their mask, and I came out with my mask, too. And it was awesome. We sat in my backyard six feet apart, um, and that, I can't wait to see that again. 
That's great. I absolutely agree. Having students just drop in my office, unexpected, they'll stop by and just say hello and they want to chat for a few minutes. I really miss that because I just enjoy them. I enjoy talking with them. They're so interesting and, and worldly and just fascinating mm-hmm. people. And so I, I, I am looking forward to seeing them on campus again, for sure. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an incredibly enlightening uh, 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 set of interviews for, for me. Uh, and I, I want to uh, just let everyone know who's on uh, on the call today to let you know that the fourth installment of Spartan Step Up, that's slated for Wednesday, June 17th, 2 p.m. Drew Poppleton, who is the Director of Postgraduate Planning and Experiential Education, he's going to be moderating a discussion focusing on career navigation. And the panelists will include alumna, Uh, Carmen Fontana, as well as Nancy Fink. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, They they are uh, invigorating and shining examples of this university. Um, I I can't wait to, to learn more about where you take us with your imaginative pedagogy. And I can't wait uh, for our faculty to continue to innovate uh, as we do here at Case Western Reserve, uh, where we think beyond the possible, where we think big. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. I wanna wish everyone good health. Uh, Don't forget, wherever you go, mask up. (laughs) Take care, guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.